Well, hey, as you can see, today is Antiques R Us. Um, what I have here is two RF generators, which I'm hoping to use. Um, honestly, I kind of bought on an impulse. Um, they, they're both broken. I'm going to try and see if I can fix them up. Uh, I would like to use one to try and get a decent uh, roll-off information on my Rigol scope. Um, these are both, should be, both be pretty interesting because they are, I believe, vacuum tube based. Uh, fortunately, the schematics for both of them are available, so they should be pretty repairable. Vacuum tubes are not that difficult to work with, they're just different. Um, as you can see, these are both quite, the mechanism in these, they're, very, they're mechanically very nice. You can see you've got a, a gear reduction, excuse me, in the tuning, so you, the, you turn the knob and this moves much more slowly. You know, and this one is the same. So both of these, you know, I'm not sure. I'm either turning a potentiometer or a very cap in there. But, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, you look at the output connector. It's this old shell connector, which I actually don't know the specific name for. But, um, yeah, let's pop the lid off one of them and have a look. So this one has this cool spring-loaded pull-out metal handle. The other one, it appears somebody has removed the handle. So one thing of interest on all of these is that if you look at them, so um, MC, 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 KC, KC, so this is mega cycles and kilocycles. And they're both done like that. And that's because um, the usage of Hertz as a term for frequency um, is actually surprisingly recent. Um, we started using Hertz, I think, sometime in the 60s or the 70s. And before that, it was megacycles and kilocycles and cycles per second, you know, instead of Hertz. Um, the decision to use Hertz as kind of a memorial thing for Mr. Hertz was fairly recent. Okay, so this one does indeed use a very cap. Let me... It also uses bog standard vacuum tube uh, construction, which is basically an interior chassis with a big hole in the back that the plug pulls through. This is... If you ever work on an old radio or anything like that, this is an extremely common building of equipment. One of the things you often have to be careful of is, um, in equipment like this, it's very common for the chassis to actually be electrically connected to neutral, um, which can be, you know, unsurprisingly quite dangerous. Um, in this context, you know, I don't know when these were made. That tends to be an early thing, like 30s-ish, I think. I don't know the dates precisely. But anyways, you can see here, we have two vacuum tubes, two transformers. So this is, this is a 6C4, and from the look of it, this is a single triode. So a single triode basically means that you have the filament in the center, a single control grid, and the, um, the cathode around it. So I may be getting some of the terms wrong. It's been a long time. It's been a few years since I've worked with vacuum tubes in any meaningful way. Um, so yeah, there's a little, yeah, there's a single triode. You can see it's got nice little sockets. These aren't high quality sockets, they're just uh, phenolic sockets. So over here we have a um, 12AT7, which looks to be a double triode. So you can see that this one, uh, basically because the expense involved in putting it, you know, in made vacuum encapsulating it is the predominant thing. One of the things that was very common for vacuum tubes is for them to put several devices, you know, in the same tube. So, you know, basically here are the two dyes. This um, silvery substance on the top is called the getter. And actually, if you look down in here, you can see there is a little uh, little metallic ring. So the way these actually work is they put them under vacuum, they pump them down, and then they stick an induction coil over here. And they shove a whole lot of current through that, and it induces a very large current in that little metallic ring. And that causes the, typically, it may be plated, I'm not actually sure how they get the metal on there. And what happens is the metal on the surface of that evaporates off and strikes, you know, sticks to the interior of the tube. So what this is, um, there's a number of different materials used for getters. 
But basically the idea is that this is a very available metallic surface. So any free oxygen or free gases in there will oxidize this and turn into a solid material that'll just basically stick to the interior of the tube. So what it does is it actually, uh, effectively it increases the vacuum in the tube over time because the free gases are actually being absorbed into the getter. And there's a number of different materials you can use for the getter that are good for uh, adsorbing. It's the, you know, it adsorbs it, it doesn't absorb it. But it, um, the, it's good for scavenging different gases depending on the different getter compositions. So, these tubes, you know, one of the things you can do is if you have a tube and the, there's no getter and there's like this white powdery deposit of the interior of the, ga or the, interior of the glass, excuse me, what that means is that the vacuum in the tube has been uh, lost. And when the getter is completely oxidized away, it basically turns white. And one of the things you'll see in very old and or abused tubes is that the edges of it, which are the thinnest areas, the edges of the getter will slowly will be white and it'll kind of slowly shrink as the tube is effectively used up. And that's actually one way to determine, you know, if a tube has gone bad. Right. So here we can see the the whole assembly. One of the interesting things I see here is that the where is the gear reduction? It appears it's entirely in the knob. That's actually so. One of the nice things is, hey, look, the set screw is slotted. No Allen key. Okay, now so here's our drive, and you can see there's probably like a, um, a a bearing reducer in there somewhere, which is a common way of, you know, it's a common, very compact way of, yeah, it uses bearings. So basically, the idea is, if you think of a ball bearing. You have the outer race, you have the balls in the middle, and then you have the inner race. And if you fix the inner race, you know, it, like in most situations, and you spin the outer race, the, the bearings will rotate at about half of the speed. Because again, they're rolling around the interior. So one of the common things they do is they actually just use like the, the bearing retainer as the takeoff. So it's a very small, compact, and it has some slip way to basically give you an inexpensive gear reduction. And that's pretty common in older electronics. So, let's just look down here. So what we have... Oh, interesting. It looks like somebody's, excuse me, it looks like somebody's done a once-over on this. Um, so a lot of old electronics are basically pretty well-renowned for uh, failing when you look away because they used uh, wax-invested paper caps. And they were incredibly, you know, basically moisture would get in there and they would fail. You know, and it looks like someone has actually gone in here and recapped this generator. Because that's 47, that's 47 puff. You know, because I don't see any paper capacitors. I see all ceramic and this very old electrolytic, which may actually be what has failed. Uh, these were both, this one was, I think, advertised as turns on, but somebody's making something in there. I think this one was advertised as turns on, but does not uh, produce an output. Um, saying um again. So what we have up here, this is 0.1 microfarad, 400 volt DC. That looks like a film cap from the packaging. Um, you know, this is very common construction. Um, this was probably a kit, actually. So somebody assembled this. But this style of construction is extremely common in vacuum tube equipment, where basically most of the components are literally hanging off of the tube sockets and wired. You know, you can see here we have a whole bunch of different inductors, uh, presumably for the different frequency ranges. You know, down here, I think... I think that's a selenium rectifier. Um, so that little box... I'm not sure, I think it's a rectifier. So one of the things you can see is the power comes in here, goes to this circuit, this little junction thing right here, uh, runs through that, goes to the back of this, and this, this is the switch. So this is a pot with a switch on it. And then it runs into this transformer. So that tells us one thing, that this is entirely floating, because the power comes in, is switched with some capacitors across it, probably to reduce arcing in the switch. 
and then run straight into a capacitor. And that's very excellent because that means that we can probe everything downstream of this transformer safely because it's floating due to the fact that it's on a transformer. If this was, you know, if this, if it didn't have this transformer, we wouldn't be able to do that. So what we have here is we have, as you can probably look down here, this transformer has two output windings. So one of these is going to be for the tube filament. So let me see if I can... Okay, so that goes through that bulb. So I'm not sure how the filaments in this tube are wired up. So basically the way tubes work is fairly simple. They're, it's just a... You have a, a filament, which is basically literally like a little light bulb, in a vacuum. And the filament gets hot and what actually happens is electrons start to boil off. And literally they form an electron cloud around the filament. And if you have a... You know, and so in this vacuum you have a filament here and if you have an electrode over here and that's positively charged because remember electrons flow from negative to positive if that is positively charged that will draw the electrons to it so basically what you have there is a diode and in fact they have vacuum diodes that are made that way that's rectifiers there's a number of ways they make them uh, so then what happens is if you put a metal mesh in the middle and that metal mesh is floating or you know charged towards you know charge the same charge as the you know basically the metal the electrode the electrons can pass right through it but if you charge that negatively it will repel the cloud of electrons and then you can't get any flow to the electrode so basically the fundamental construction of a vacuum tube is a a filament a grid typically wrapped around the filament and then the outer electrode which i believe is the cathode but it's been a while so uh, that's a simple that's a triode and then there are other tube constructions that, you know, like the pentode, which has three control filaments, which allow them to do some other stuff. But, um, I'm actually not sure why this doesn't work. It looks like it would. Let's, um, see, maybe one of the tubes is bad. So let's, that's kind of a frightening plug. So. The light bulb. But the tubes are... So if we look here, you can see that this tube is definitely coming up because you can see that there's a little orange glow in it. And I, I don't know if this, this one's visible, but I see the filament in both of them glowing. And that's actually a simple way to confirm tube functionality. So that's a very basic confirmation of tube functionality. You can see the filament pokes out of the top of the, the electrode so that you can see that it's... Um, you know, that one's working, and this one is not as visible. But basically, so that's required to make the tube work. And there's several different types of tubes. There's directly heated, you know, which basically means the filament's used directly, and then there's indirectly heated, which means the filament is typically inside, like, a cylinder of material, conductive material, and it heats that conductive material. Uh, okay. So. It may just be that the reason they thought this didn't work is the power light was burnt out. I don't drop it. And that is indeed burnt. So one of the interesting things is, if you remember what I was saying about how they evaporate metal onto the glass, sometimes when bulbs blow, it actually leaves a silvery coating on the glass. This is much more common in halogens because the filament's much thicker in halogen bulbs. But that's actually what's happening is the metal from the filament is evaporating off onto the, the, the surface of the glass. One of the major problems I've been having is output flatness. Ergo, lots of different, you know, I have equipment, you know, that outputs, you know, some wide, some fairly wide bandwidth signals. But the issue is, is the output is not flat. In other words, you know, basically, I, I, I don't know whether my, my amplitude modulation is due to roll off in the equipment or due to non-linearities in the, you know, basically, I don't know if it's the roll-off in the scope or roll-off in the, roll-off in the scope or roll-off in the signal generator, which basically means I can't do a meaningful calibration. Let's see. Clear. I like this delete. So let me go to normal. So one of the things, oops, script bananas.
So one of the things you have to be aware of with tubes is they are they do use high voltage. So one thing I'm using a 10 to 1 probe. So that is just garbage. Oh wait, no, I'm getting something. So we certainly have an ugly ass signal. But okay, so I think this is just an ugly signal today. So uh, let's see. Hold on. Hold on. Is this DC coupled? So as you can see as I adjust this, so the first thing you can see is the output of the signal generator is kind of crap, which is not too big of a deal. Um, oh, I had it really attenuated. So RF generators are often used to generate really, really small signals because, again, you're going into a radio which needs to be able to, you know, extract really, really, really small signals from basically the air. So having, you know, freaking minute outputs is not too unusual. So let's see, right now I am on range C, which should be 1.9 megacycles to 7 megacycles. So let's add some measurements. Counter channel 1, source. Yeah, so this is 3 megahertz, which is about 3 point, <laughs> it's off by a bit. I'm at, so that should be 3.4 megahertz and 3.1. So, you know, again, ooh, it's high and nicely calibrated. So, there we go, that should be 7 megahertz and it's 6.6. .6. But, anyways, so let's. So, that actually is a lot nicer looking. Huh, range E doesn't work. Ooh, that just made a snapping noise. So there may be bad parts in here, but it appears, in fact, I'm pretty confident there's bad parts in here, because that waveform is, you know, this thing should put out a fairly cyanish output, I would imagine. So fortunately, with a lot of these old electronics, it's uh, entirely possible to, the schematics are freely available, because again, most of them were sold as kits. But anyways, there you go. So that seems to mostly work. It's probably got some bad capacitors in it. Uh, there may be some regulation issues. I have to hold the power button for a second. So that is off. So we will put that aside and let's look inside the other one. So this one's fairly interesting because it's got, you can see how the bands work, it's got bands, 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 bands. And you can also see it looks like there's a disc that rotates past these windows. And you've got um, RF fine, RF coarse, power off, RF external modulation, internal modulation, out. Um, and then you've got, so this is audio in and out. And one of the things you can do with these that's kind of fun is you can turn them into a a uh, very little, compact, inexpensive AM transmitter. Basically, you just set the oscillator into the AM band, plug an MP3 player or whatever in here, and it's an AM transmitter. You just need to hang some wire off here and ignore the impedance mismatch. <laughs> but, you know, that shouldn't affect it. Tubes are actually much harder. One of the nice things about vacuum tubes is they their failure modes is much more gradual. Uh, they don't tend to catastrophically fail as transistors do. They tend to take a little while, you know, basically they will actually, they will start glowing, you know, cherry and cherry red and, you know, it, the, their failure mode is much more gradual and often if you're being attentive, you know, it'll take them a couple minutes to fail and typically what happens with the tube when it fails is it gets extremely hot and m gases start to boil out of the metal in the tube, basically because there's you know, gases actually, I think they dissolve in the metal when they're casting it. And if you get it hot enough, that be, they be, it becomes mobile and it gets out into the tube. And the tube becomes gassy, which basically means that the vacuum is no longer as good and the performance begins to decline.
but there's no, I mean, the only catastrophic failure mode where it's, it's working and then it suddenly stops working would be the glass actually rupturing. There's no, <laughs> this has been repaired by somebody. It's got some non-stock screws in it. There's the last one. So, this one has a big berry cap too. And two tubes, and Ico branded tubes, that's interesting. So I actually, I'm not actually formally trained as an electrical engineer. I have, uh, basically I spent, I think around eight or nine years basically kind of lurking around a bunch of old graybeards who actually, you know, build, electro, you know, design electronics and were really overly enthusiastic almost about tube amplifiers. And that's actually how I picked up most of what I know. So I'm a little, you know, some of the, the, math, the math fundamentals and so forth that underpin, I'm a little bit inexperienced in. I can typically, you know, that's a little bit, I can, whatever it is, I can generally look it up if I need to. I just don't have much of it memorized. But the end result is that I also picked up an inordinate amount of bizarro knowledge about stuff like vacuum tubes that are of dubious utility in the modern age, but nevertheless, there you go. So, you can see this is actually, that actually is either copper or copper plated. But this one is going to need to be recapped because I bet that cap has failed. I bet that cap has failed. Um, so these are, they're, it's a, um, basically met metal foil and paper capacitor and then they, they dip it in wax to seal it and unsurprisingly for something using wax the sealing is typically crap and fails so you can actually see this is fairly interesting this is a three leaded capacitor and what that is is that's actually two separate capacitors in the same package that's actually fairly common for bypass caps of the era where, you know, basically they'd need some bypass caps and you can just buy a, like a bypass cap in a box that has all of your various capacitance you needed. So these, one thing of note for all of these is that the filament on these tubes is all done using AC. In other words, there's just a winding on the transformer. Let me see if I can't see. Oh, I see. So you see, actually, one of the things you notice here is that two of the outputs of the transformer is one from the yellow winding and one from the red winding just go into this terminal of this capacitor, which actually is connected across to the line. I don't know why they're doing that. Um, and then this terminal of this terminal strip is actually just connected to the chassis. So the chassis forms one of the connections for nearly everything in here. You can see how these terminate to the chassis. You know, this terminates to the chassis. Let's see, I don't see any chassis terminations up here. But basically the chassis of this is used as one of the watt conductors to reduce the wiring. But uh, in other words, sorry, I got off track. The basically one of the terminals of the transformer is just stuck directly on the tubes. That means they're um, they're AC filament, and that's fairly common. It's not really that big of a problem. Uh, you'll see some, you know, audiophile people complaining and wanting to use uh, rectified and smooth DC for the the um, filament, which is of dubious efficacy, but it's something people do. So I think this, yeah, that's almost definitely a diode, or, or a, it's probably actually a selenium rectifier, just a potted selenium rectifier. That's actually fairly interesting, I haven't seen that type of rect selenium rectifier before. But that should be possible, so, you know, this is obviously, it's half wave rectified. And we can guess from the fact that this wire is leading to here, that this is probably a, this is going to be the high voltage winding, and this is going to be the uh, filament. So one thing we could do that would probably be of interest is, let me figure out where my mold, there it is. I have not got enough space. So we can take my meter. Let's see, this is definitely off. So if you can see the meter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on, and the power light has come on. 
and then I am going to look here. So you can see our high voltage is hmm, dropping. So we should actually um, let's go to AC and look here. So we have 134.9 volts AC. So actually that means that this reading here that's actually fairly good. And one of the things you probably actually saw is that it was originally 150 volts. So I suspect what's happening is that this was basically entirely unloaded. And then as the filaments begin to warm up, the tubes begin to become conductive and the circuit effectively begins to work and the voltage dropped. So I would guess that that's probably why that that, that, um, that sagged down like that. So that's just me talking out of my, uh, my guesstimator. You can try and guess where that is anatomically. So, ooh -hoo, something on here smells like it's getting hot. Oh, it's the bulb, of course. So, one of the nice things is you can see this one has this little bit of plexiglass, and it's, it's side illuminated so that the whole gauge kind of lights up. It's very, you know, it's a nice little touch. So all of these, as you can see, use a, um, a variable capacitor for their f signal tuning. You can see, you know, typical very cap construction, two sections of metal plates that intermesh, and that basically changes the capacitance, and then they've got little bits of phenolic to hold them steady. This is a choke from the look of it. Yeah, it's got two leads. Um, not sure what they're using it for. They're... Oh, yeah, so actually look down there. This is a, a, a Model 50 um, Yeah, it's a diode. So you can see the little label on that. You know, it's probably 3G. It's a, uh, I mean, it says positive right by that. So that's definitely some form of rectification. Let me get that in closer. So you can see that little nameplate on there. I'm not sure. That may be a solid, that may be a really, really, really early solid state diode. Let's see if I'm getting any output from this one. So one of the things I'm worried about is, again, you know, I have 200 volts in here. So you have to be a little careful. Um, times 10 probe should make that more or less safe, I would think. Uh, you always want to connect your ground first. You got to be careful you don't stick your finger in the AC. That should be in there, and hey, look, we're getting output from this too. So this is again kind of rather ghastly looking, but this one appears to work too. So I don't know what the the eBay seller I bought this from who claimed the guy I bought this from said they didn't work. So you know. I think they both have some problems, but, you know, so let's, oh, hey, that looks pretty good. So now we're, we're at, uh, so we have the same, you know, rather ghastly waveform. So I, I think there are some bad capacitors in both of these. We'll have to see, I'll, I'm not going to fix those on the screen. Um, one of the things of interest is the high frequency does not go anywhere near as high as it should, and in fact, it appears it adjusts the wrong way. See, so this is that's normally lower frequency, and this is higher frequency. So that's lower frequency, and this is higher frequency. So if I turn the knob back and forth, oh wait, no, oh, it's working properly. Never mind, I'm being stupid. But one of the things you can see is that, well. Oh no, it's getting up to the frequency it's supposed to. So one thing you can see here is here's a, a 97 megahertz signal. You know, so we start to, you can see it, it rolls off right around there. And I'm not sure if that's in the scope or not. But above that, you know, there's some amplitude wobble. 
and it actually starts to take off. But yeah, you can start to see, you can see that the scope is, you know, it's responsive to well into, you know, there's 125 megahertz. So this is a 100 megahertz scope, and actually I've, you can see waveforms that go up to a gigahertz with this scope, amazingly enough. You have to be careful that you have to be in the 4 gig examples per second to do that. Uh, they're really attenuated, but it seems like the roll-off in the scope is not a, uh, it's not a low-pass filter, it's merely a gain roll-off in the input stage. So, you know, as long as you're willing to accept fairly small signal amplitudes, the scope will basically go up to the Nyquist of this signal, you know. Again, you, you have trouble seeing a clear a waveform with uh, two sample points per waveform at a gigahertz, but with four samples per waveform you can make out an, an acceptable sign which is pretty freaking impressive and the frequency counter and everything works up to 500 to a gigahertz too or 940 megahertz it's pretty crazy um, but yeah this is about what I was expecting you know I mean there's a lot of amplitude wobble but you can see that there's no real meaningful roll off you know you can see that little drop off there is I think probably the generator and the other thing you can see is that this is a um, a really ugly waveform. You can see with the intensity grading, which I love. It's so awesome. And, you know, toys, you know, compared to some of the oldest scope I had, it's oh, so nice. Oh, 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 oh. Anyways, so, aside from my waffling alone. So I am confused. Because the guy who sold me these said neither of them worked, and they both worked. <laughs> One of them just seemed to have a bad power LED. Um, it's distinctly possible that it came with this output cable, and it's possible that this output cable has a break in the cable, and that's what they're using to test it. <laughs> um, that would be uh, kind of tragilarious, to be honest. Um, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> um, you know, again funky ass old output connectors, I'll probably, I'd actually, what I'll probably do is I'll probably replace the outputs with BNCs, because fuck all this old shit. Uh, anyways, so you can see there's a lot of amplitude variation in, what the deuce is that? Um, this may perform a lot better if I put it in the case. Um, I don't, I'm waving my hand around a circuit and it doesn't seem like that, a little tiny bit of straight capacitance has a mean, too much of an issue. Um, You can also see that the top band is rolled off. So one thing is this has two F bands. It has 37 to 145 megacycles, and it has 110 megacycles to a 435 megacycle. And I don't know how to go from F1 to F2. Uh, I'm going to need to find the docks, I guess. But you can see on the back, uh, this circuit's quite nice internally. Um, Plug it. So, one thing that I noticed when I was working on this earlier is, um, where is it? See that resistor right there? That resistor right there, that's a bleeder resistor because you can see it goes from the terminal of the output of the diode to the case. So that makes me feel better because that means that this circuit is going to be pretty thoroughly discharged pretty close to immediately after this, you, you unplug the system. It'll take maybe a few seconds. Actually, that would be an interesting experiment. Let me do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is... So one nice thing about these, working on stuff like this, is you need a ground to scrub the case. So it's possible that there's a whole lot of AC ripple on the power supply, and since this is a times 10 probe, which goes up to 50 volts per div... Oh yeah, that's pretty sad. Um, so... Right now, I'm just across the main bypass cap, and yeah, that's 50 volts per div. So, that should be 60 hertz, so let's actually see if we can source AC line. Yep, that's 60 hertz synchronous. That might explain that crappy-ass waveform. So we have, um, let's see, what is our, where is my peak-to-peak? There we go. Huh. That is 45 volts of power supply ripple. Yeah, that's going to work well. 
actually, um, yeah, so that may be part of the problem. So, oh wait, I'm on, no, I'm on the output of the diode, actually. That's slightly less. I'm not too sure how this capacitor works because it looks like um, is that a bleeder resistor? No, it's not a bleeder resistor. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. It appears the connect capacitor is connected across this resistor. Oh, I think it's a CRC filter, so it's a capacitor, a resistor, and a capacitor. So I think this is the output of that filter, which is only 35 volts of supply ripples only. Um, but one of the things we can do is we can go into, let's go to DC. So you can see that we have a, um, a pretty considerable offset. Um, let's see, V average. So we have a 115 volts roughly, which means that this may just be a one-to-one -one transformer with a 38 volts of ripple on it. <laughs> so that, um, that's pretty horrible, and I bet that's what's causing that amplitude variation in the output. Uh, I think this thing is probably referenced to its, its high voltage rail pretty directly, and I suspect that basically what we're seeing is as the power supply voltage va varies, the output voltage peak-to-peak -peak varies, and that's probably why we're getting that great big modulation in output amplitude. But that's easy enough to fix. I just need to find some 200 volt caps, which I don't have on hand. <laughs> Anyways, so you can see that's the power supply discharging down, and that doesn't take too long. So it's it's safe to finger around and stick your appendage in within maybe a minute or two. You know, basically 30 seconds. Actually, while I'm thinking about power supply. Let me, let's look at the power supply of the other one. Also, I want to confirm that that funky brick, the funky lump thing is in fact a selenium rectifier. So, so you know, again, this is um, probably not the safest thing I've ever done. Uh, don't do this unless you're fairly confident you're not going to hurt yourself. You know, typical, usual, blah de blah de blah. Um, so this should be the output of what I would bet is the selenium rectifier. Alright, well this one seems to have nice clean power supply, so that means the bypass cap on this is not bad. So you can see here if I... Let's see, where's the reset statistics? So this one's 145 volts with approximately 10 volts of ripple on it, which is not great, but, you know, that's, you know, a quarter of what the other one was. And then this actually looks like it's got a, a, an RCR filter on it as well. So, that seems to be a common. So yeah, you can see that this is, I think, the actual supply. So if you look in here, oops, my tripod is stuck. So you can see that this is another one of these double, ah, stop focusing on the this is another one of these double capacitors, and you can see that there's a lead. So, output of this, this rectifier stack here, this linear rectifier, runs to this terminal here, which has one of the leads on the capacitor, goes through this resistor, and then comes to this terminal here. So I'm just scoping on this bare wire here. <laughs> Don't stick your appendage in there, whichever appendage you may prefer. Um, one thing I've noticed, it looks like whoever made this was running low on wire because this is nicely bent over. So yeah, it's actually interesting. You can see that the high voltage rail is running to all of those inductors. So I may need to replace this capacitor here. In fact, I probably will. But this is um, 20 plus 20 mics. So this is a, that means this is two 20 mic caps. Um, 150 volt DC. Who made it? This is probably Sprague. Because they're the people who made it. 
most of these parts. Anyways, so there is just a a very quick. Ooh, okay, something in there is capacitively coupled to the line. Um, oh, I know what's going on. The whole thing's floating, so it's capacitively coupled all over the place. Ooh, hoo, hoo, tingly. I can feel that in my interesting places. So yeah, um, don't do this if you have an arrhythmia. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll, I'll probably put three terminal power leads on these because that's um, a little frightening. One thing I've noticed that uh, typically when something's really bad, when you have really bad capacitive coupling, you'll actually see a spark when you go to connect your ground lead, in which case that it's kind of a good notification to you to, you know, do something, be careful. <laughs> but the, actually, how I shocked myself is, you know, basically I'm standing on a carpet, sitting on a chair that's floating, so, you know, basically if I'm not grabbing any of these wires, you know, because I'm electrically isolated by virtue of the fact that I'm not connected to anything, and I'm not, you know, I'm in, sitting in a puddle, even if this chassis was live right now, I could go like that and not be hurt because, again, I'm not electrically connected to anything else, so therefore no net current can flow. Because the critical thing is, the thing that hurts you is current, not voltage. So you need voltage to induce the current, but if you stick needles in your skin, you know, basically break the skin barrier, it doesn't take much to hurt you because, again, you know, blood is fairly conductive. And the really dangerous thing is one hand to the other hand, or one hand to one of your legs. Um, like, across your hand, that'll just leave you burns, and it'll hurt like a motherfucker, but you don't generally need to worry too much about, you know, actually one of the things you do if you're working on high voltage stuff and you're being extra careful is you make sure you're not standing anything, put one hand behind your back, and then you go adjust stuff. Because there's one hand behind your back, and as long as you're wearing rubber shoes and not standing in a puddle, or not, you know, contacting anything, just touching one hand, touching high voltages won't hurt you. Um, you may get a tingle through the capacitive coupling, but because again, there's no current path, because the current has nowhere to leave your body, you're fine. You can be floating and you can drive your vo body, vo you know, basically that you can drive your body up to high voltages without hurting yourself. Um, the really dangerous thing is hot ground, because then you have this current path, you know, from one arm through right across your heart, which is the thing that you don't want to stop. And in fact, the only button, you know, the dangerous thing, and then out the other arm. You know, the other thing is typically, you know, a short from your hand, you know, to your leg, not, you know, on your right side, probably not as much of a deal as on your left side, though you'll still have some gradients across your heart, which are a bad idea. Um, you know, what I just had was purely capacitive coupling, which is just tingly. It's, uh, you know, you know, if you work around high voltage electronics or tube stuff, you'll learn to appreciate that, but it's not really as dangerous. Um, probably if you have an arrhythmia or some sort of cardiac issues it might be a real problem. But, you know, I'm fairly young. I'm, well, I'm generally healthy. I need to lose weight, but that's another issue. Uh, so I can kind of be okay with it. I don't like it, you know, so I'll probably be more careful. But it's not going to kill me. Probably. And if it does, I, you know, whatever. I won't be around to regret it. Anyways, um, so, you know, there's basically just kind of a little overview, a little waffling on about how tubes work. Uh, two of the signal generators I picked up off eBay. Um, it already made me feel pretty good. You saw how the scope is responsive up to 130 megahertz without any real trouble. Oh, that's funny. Look, I can back drive it. I'm adjusting the capacitor. So I am kind of happy, actually, because both of these work, and it looks like they just need some new capacitors. I'm not sure why the output waveform is so god-awful ugly. Um, that may just be an unavoidable uh, aspect of the topologies that you need to drive it. And I can probably feed that through like a, um, a CLC filter to clean it up and get myself a nice sign for some testing purposes. Um, realistically, I'm probably going to test with these and then probably throw this one back on eBay because I don't really need it. Um, you know, I'll need to track down. This is a GB47 bulb. So this is just, you know, a little bayonet bulb. There's lots of old bulb standards. You know, this one's bayonet lock, which means push and twist. I bet this one, this one looks like it's threaded. 
you know. So I'll have to order some parts for these, but these they seem to work fine. I'm pretty happy. You know, I can do some simple stuff. You know, replace the dot. You know, replace that selenium thing with a like a one n four thousand two silicon rectifier. You know, that's one n four thousand two is two hundred volts, which should be plenty because this is definitely not one hundred and ten two hundred and forty. <laughs> um, actually. Yeah, there's just a part number on the transformer, it doesn't tell me anything else about it. These things, you know, I, I think I spent 50 bucks for both of these, and that was $30 for them and $20 for shipping. <laughs> so I would pretty readily expect I could make that back by fixing them up and putting them back on eBay. If anyone needs one of these, it's going to be up there probably in a month or so once I get parts and get off my duff. Very caps are cool. One of the interesting things on these is you can see that these aren't perfectly hemispherical, so the engagement is... Not a, they're designed so that they engage in kind of an interesting logarithmic manner. I still wonder where the gear reduction is. It's somewhere in there. But they're cool little devices. I actually I want to find the schematics for these. I saw a schematic for one, but it used a potentiometer rather than a very cap. So I suspect that there are several versions of this that are probably in the same thing. As I understand it, I believe most of these were sold as kits. You know, I think basically this was like a heat kit knockoff. Heat kit, if you know, if you're not familiar with heat kit, you should go Google it and look at some of their stuff because they made. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna sneeze. But, <coughs> excuse me. The heat kit made basically educational electronic kits. You know, 50s, 60s, 70s. They kind of died out in the 80s. But they made some of the stuff that basically brought up the last generation of electrical engineers. And it's really a tragedy that they're out of business nowadays. Because they made some really wonderful things. You know, you can still find, they made you know, basically test equipment kits that you could assemble yourself. And they had excellent instructions. And every now and then if you look around on eBay you can find them unassembled. And if it's something you need you can buy it and kind of sob quietly in a corner while you put it together. Um, but the, if you, you know, Google Heathkit, it's pretty cool to look at all the stuff they did, it's, you know, and they have excellent manuals and available schematics, and what the hell does internal modulation do? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, it has internal modulation, but, uh, I suspect that these were both, you know, similar to Heathkit, especially from, you know, basically the, the weird heterogeneous wiring used in here, you know. weird wire colors. I, I have trouble believing that that was production. It, it very much looks like something that we would see in somebody who had wire, especially with how tight these are and how that's, like you can, I don't know if you can make it out, but you can see that that inductor is all bent over. Um, fortunately it doesn't seem to have affected it. It's basically just a coil of wire on what looks like a phenolic, a paper phenolic tube. But I would like to put new wires in there that are a little longer so I can straighten that up. Uh, I think these are probably ceramic capacitors. I haven't seen capacitors with that particular version. Oh, wow. If you look down in there, there's actually a silver mica cap. That's expensive and fancy pants. Um, yeah, nice little switches, you know. I'm actually kind of surprised. One of the problems you have with old stuff like this is the potentiometer is going to be very uh, oxidized up. So, you know, you adjust the knob and it doesn't really make any difference. Or what happens is it's, it's noisy. But, um... It's a meaningful switch. This may actually have two oscillators in it because it supposedly has internal modulation, which makes me think there's probably a little sine wave oscillator over here somewhere. I'm not sure. They may, you know, one of the things with tubes is that you really, more devices with tubes is very expensive because as you can see they're large. So one of the things that's extremely common with tubes is really, really clever circuits for basically getting one circuit to do, or you know, getting one tube to do a whole lot of stuff by being clever about things. Which is something you don't really see anymore and it's, I think it's kind of a loss because that's frankly really cool. You know, they do some really cool stuff with tubes just to try and reduce the number of, you know, basically amplification devices. 
and uh, it's it's a approach to electronics that I think should be if not necessarily aggressively practiced I think people should have to think about it just because you know you often up with simpler uh, electrically simpler you know designs you know having basically trying to limit yourself to a minimum of devices tends to lead to you trying you winding up having to come up with you know again you know excessive cleverness can be injurious but you know being economical i think is can be quite helpful particularly when you know uh, i don't know i've lost my train of thought but it just it's just neat to kind of look at how they were people spent all, a lot of engineering effort to try and minimize i mean you have to realize that this has the vacuum tube equivalent of three transistors three only and that does everything, you know, all the ranges, all the amplitude modulation. So, yeah. It's just cool stuff. I mean, you know, like the 5 tube radio was extremely common, you know. All American 5 is a, uh, you know, it was a common radio topology, you know. TVs used maybe 10 or 20, I don't know off the top of my head. You know, it, it's amazing, you know, how simple some of the stuff can be done with, you know, a bit of cleverness. Uh, custom my own inductors. <laughs> One of the things that you see a lot is the specialty, you know, inductors of all sorts. You know, you see lots of inductors, a lot more than you see nowadays. You know, basically they're only typically seem to be around in L switching filters these days. And really, really fancy pants uh, analog uh, filters. But with vacuum tube stuff, inductors are everywhere because they really needed, you know, to be able to use them. I mean, you can see this is actually a choke, transformer around choke. And, the only place you see stuff like that these days is like fancy pants audio electronics. You know, and then those typically have vacuum tubes anyways, and they needed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you can have a choke input filter or stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's interesting to kind of examine the techniques of a previous age. You know, vacuum tubes are kind of fundamentally different from transistors in that vacuum tubes are a voltage gain device, whereas transistors are a current gain device. So vacuum tubes, they're uh, basically the gate, the grid voltage. With, with the grid, it's the voltage that affects the output, and with transistors, it's the base current. It's not the base voltage. So actually, what actually wound up happening is right around the transitions from, tra you know, from tubes to transistors, there were a couple years of really bad amp designs where nobody, people were trying to use transistors like tubes, as voltage gain devices, which doesn't really work. Uh, so there was a few years where everyone was kind of figuring out how transistors work when they first became available, you know, broadly, you know, to, you know, with the epitaxial transistor rather than the, uh, the point contact transistor, which were available for a number of years, but were never very successful. You saw the occasional transistorized pocket radio, which was kind of one of the predominant applications of early transistors, just because they were so much lower power. Uh, portable tube radios are, uh, there was such a thing. They, they made portable tube radios. And they actually made these little specialty batteries, 50 volt, 100 or 100 volt batteries that were a huge number of cells in a little like a, a big C cell package. And they probably were, you know, 10 or 20 milliamp hours, but the high voltages in these things need so little power, or excuse me, so little current that it ran fine. So you'd actually have a, like a tube radio, a portable tube radio that took a 50 volt or 100 volt battery and a 6 volt battery. And the 6 volt battery ran all the filaments and the 50 volt battery ran everything else. Uh, and then, you know, they'd use an output transformer to shift the high voltage, low current output of the, you know, all the electronics out into, you know, like an 8 ohm speaker load. Uh, output transformers are something that are also very common on tube electronics, you know, or at least tube amplifiers, which are the area of tube electronics with which I am the most common, excuse me, most familiar. But it's cool stuff to look at, you know. Frankly, I think tubes are just freaking cool. Look at, you know, I mean, all the blown glass and the fact that they glow. I mean, who doesn't want their electronics to, like, light up and glow orange when it's running? I mean, that's like... I don't know, maybe I watch too much Star Trek, but I think electronics should have flashing lights and indicators everywhere, and tubes seem to be much more satisfying in that respect than, than transistors, which just kind of sit there and amplify without looking like they're doing anything interesting. Yeah, anyways, cool. Hope you found that interesting.